Well, it, it really, it feels to me like we're at an inflection point in, in the next even two months that in, in history that we'll be, we will be telling the story of how we were as a community and what we did in the yep. summer and fall of 2020 for a, for a long time. Um, it is, it, well, what do they, what do they say about the curse? It's a curse to live in interesting times. It really is. Yeah. And, uh, uh, now history tends to get written and rewritten by posterity. Uh, so we have no idea what 21 and 30 and 40 will do to reflect, to change the inflection, but it does seem that a whole lot is in the, in the mix right now. Uh, climate change, pandemic, politics, uh, and they're all swirling together. And in the end, I do think there's reason, not just to hope, but, but to care and that the role of the, of the religious communities in the country, uh, and I, I, I can be critical a little bit. I think sometimes Unitarian Universalists tend to valorize the street march and the protest. There's, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. But there are other roles to play and they are distinctly religious ones. Just, uh, we need to be able to be religious in this context, not just political. And so I'm hoping Unitarian Universalists see our religion as a gift, not as an end in itself, not just a means to a political end. And uh, I'm still working on that myself. Yeah, no, that, that's, um, I don't know that it's in this sermon, but I've, I've seen you write uh, about uh, Reinhold Nieper and it, it feels, some of what oh, you're yeah. saying feels, feels Nieperian. Uh, in well, I, mean, and I would advise you, anyone, Unitarian Universalist. These political writings are newly appropriate. Moral yeah. man and immoral society yeah. is a really good insight about human nature. And uh, his reflections on American history, while imperfect, are still really powerful about the tragic nature of, human, of the human condition. We are very optimistic people. But a tragic worldview is actually a very healthy one and a very hopeful one. It's James Luther Adams we, we valorize all the time and we forget that the five smooth stones, the last one or the second of the last one, I can't remember which, says that we have faith that there are resources, both divine and human, to warrant an ultimate vision, attitude of hope, not a proximate vision of hope but an ultimate attitude of hope and that it takes resources, both human and divine. And if your people are listening, oh, I'm an atheist. No, it's, it's we're talking about resources that are larger than we know, mm -hmm. that are capable of being present. We can call it nature. We can call it history. We can call it the cosmos. It's not about a particular divinity. It's that if we open ourselves to the capacities around us. Have you read The Overstory, by the way? Book about trees. No, and I haven't. It's on my one of, never ending yeah, Well, I haven't read a lot of books, but the reason I'm mentioning this is that I think we're becoming aware that non-human life is not just to be protected. It has gifts to give us if we can learn from it. Yeah. And I think that's what I would include in that resources divine, the, the cosmos as a, as a whole and its parts our partners in this salvation effort we need to be able to believe in. Salving, of course, sounds like going to heaven, but yeah. for me, it comes from that Latin word for health and wholeness. We can have a more whole, more complete, more, more humane world if we can reach beyond the merely human. And that's what I'm thinking. So read Niebuhr, read Adams, but most important, listen to me on Sunday. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, with that, thank you so much for your time. Hey, it's good fun to, to talk, Oscar. It's always great to talk to another guy from Baltimore. Go Orioles!